Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our first Blueware Lunch and Learn. We'll just walk you through a brief presentation of what you can accomplish with something we call interactive deep learning with a data-centric focus. So my name is Julian Chenin. I'm a geophysical data scientist here at Blueware, and I'm joined by several of our esteemed colleagues, uh, data scientists and geoscientists that we're working with. So what we'd like to do first is make a key differentiation between the current view, which is a model-centric AI versus data-centric. Previously, and as it is kind of currently, people focus on the model. What they'll do is that they'll train the model, they'll do some error analysis, they'll fine-tune those hyperparameters for that given model, and then they'll continue to iterate. So they focus specifically on the code itself. In the AI system, it is a combination of code as well as the data. In the data-centric world, instead of focusing on the latest kind of complicated model and very robust in the literature, instead we kind of take a focus towards the data. If we focus on providing better labels, better training data to the model, by that token, it'll actually perform significantly better and converge to a solution faster than using a more complicated and robust model. So rather than focusing on the algorithm, whether it's a UNet or an ENet, right, instead, we focus on the labels and try to make those as best as possible. So you train the model, you do your error analysis, and then you tune your data, you fine tune your labels. And that's the key difference between model-centric versus data-centric. And that's what we're doing at Blueware. Specifically, what this allows us to do is something we call interactive deep learning, where you're fine tuning that data in real time. So let's dive a little deeper into what that means. We'll start with an industry-recognized data set, which is ImageNet. And this is commonly used as a benchmark for many of the current algorithms that are being published today. How can I best evaluate my model? Is it performing that much better? And so ImageNet is composed of billions of different images, and the labels are mostly true. In this instance, we have several labels of dogs, and we see them that they are, in fact, dogs. But we also have sailboats, and we see that they're, in fact, sailboats. But here's where you have some limitations with that model-centric approach. You have some inherently incorrect labels. Here we see that we have a station wagon, but actually that's a car wheel. Uh, me as a musician, even though as a drummer, I, I'm not too sure on that, I can definitely tell that that is not an oboe and that should actually be a flute. And this is where the problem with model-centric approaches come in. If you don't focus on the data, you just focus on the model, you're gonna have some poor predictions because of the incorrect labels. With the data-centric approach, now, what if there was a way to actually correct those faulty labels? What if there was a method that as you were training, you could actually go in and say, no, that's actually not a station wagon, that's actually a car wheel, and you focus on the data. And this is the exact same approach that we're taking in the seismic domain. Here I have several interpretations, or in this case, specifically labels for a reservoir, and that's shown in the color green. But if we look at one of the other labels, the fifth label, in some areas, we've actually missed part of that reservoir extent. And so this goes back to the previous case, right, where we have some misleading or some incorrect labels. And so if we feed this into the algorithm, we're gonna get some poor predictions. They won't be as optimal. But now, what if you could actually use the inference to prediction from the neural network to give you feedback on those labels in real time and help you actually correct those labels, characterize the flow extent of the reservoir, correct whether it was an oboe or a flute, and similarly with other geological features. And that's the concept of interactive AI. By using this interactive approach, this is where we focus in specifically on the data itself. We'll start with a blank section here with the amplitude, and we see that there's some faults present we'll put our basic interpretation, right? And that's again shown in green. And here in yellow, this is the prediction made by the neural network. And we can see that in some instances, we've actually missed part of the extent of that fault. And so we're using the feedback, this kind of network guided infill for the labeling process to help us really focus in on that data, provide the best possible labels. And when you feed that into the neural network, again, it'll learn significantly faster, it'll be more accurate, and it can be applied to the entire data set. What's really unique about this is that the process is happening every 30 seconds. You're essentially getting a new deployment 
of that model across the entire data set in full 3D based on those labels every 30 seconds. So you actually work in tandem, in real time. It's almost like a dance with the neural network. You as the geoscientists are in full control during the entire label and training process. Rather than having the labels essentially starting at, pro at step B, feeding it into an algorithm and then evaluating and fine tuning those hyperparameters in the model centric approach, now in the data centric approach, you're correcting it in real time and you're fine tuning those labels and focusing in on that optimal solution. For the data scientists, really honing in on that global minima, right? And so now what I'd like to walk you through when we've covered the interactive data centric approach is focusing on the Scarborough gas field. We'll be showing three different case studies and this is really to emphasize what is possible and the level of detail that you can achieve using this new approach. So the first one will be characterizing petroleum system elements, faults, as well as shallow hazards. What I have shown here is the blank section. This is an unpredicted line. These are, it has no labels on it. It's the raw prediction made by the neural network. What we can bring in is the prediction for what we call the source rock interval, or the economic basement, right? This specific interval was supported by well data as well as the literature, and what we have here, this is the prediction, and we can see how it's snapping, and it's actually able to differentiate between the offset and the planes that are present in the seismic section. We could then bring in the reservoir, right? Specifically in this area, it's a deep water turbidite, it's a fan. We can also bring in the seal, right? Looking at how it extends throughout the survey, and we can also bring in the faults. What I want to note is that each one of these predictions were trained with a separate neural network. What we trained for the faults is completely separate from what was trained from the reservoir. And we use that data-centric approach for each one of them. So essentially, you can think of it as a fine-tuned labeling and prediction for each one of these geological elements. We can also take the same approach for characterizing shallow gas. And again, these are all of the predictions. Right? These are not a label and then the prediction on the same line. It's being predicted actually on the complete opposite end of the survey. And this entire process from data import to labeling and finally to the predictions, this is all done in 11 and a half hours. That's just under a day to characterize the entire petroleum system elements for the Scarborough gas field. So it's a very accelerated process, especially when you're using that interactive approach to help you fine tune those labels and zero in on that optimal solution. But more importantly, as geoscientists, we like to look at things in the 3D world, right? And so what you can do is that from those probability cubes, you can go directly into extracting geobodies as well as fault sticks and fault planes. For here, right, we're looking at the prediction for that source rock interval, but now we've extracted the geobody. But what you can do is juxtapose it with well data and very quickly, in under a day, you get to get that high level of detail for that specific geologic feature. Already, we can see that there's significant offset in the economic basement, right? We can see different faulting directions. We can also see some other lineaments that are pronounced in the opposite direction. So maybe there's another faulting direction to consider in this system, right? We talked about fault sticks. Going directly from those fault probability cubes, right, you can extract those into interpretable fault sticks that can be edited. Because of course, as geoscientists, we want to be able to work with that data after the fact. It's one thing to do cool, deep learning. It's more important to actually be able to use those on the assets, right? And that's something very critical about the data-centric approach, because it allows you to hone in on that optimal solution. You can also bring in the geobody for the reservoir. Right? And immediately, we're starting to get a better idea about potential compartmentalization, how those basement faults are interacting with the source rock interval and allowing for hydrocarbons to migrate into the reservoir. Finally, you can bring in the shallow faults, right? Identify that polygonal faulting zone along with the extent of the seal in that petroleum system. And what we can see is actually some of those deeper faults are extending all the way through the reservoir and they're actually breaching the seal. And you can see that same lineament pronounced on the surface of that top seal geobody. And then finally, of course, we can bring in the shallow gas, those same geobodies as before. And we can juxtapose it with well data, with well logs, and kind of bring together the story and understand how this petroleum system has evolved in a full 3D view. 
And again, what was critical about this is that in just under a day, you're able to get a better understanding of your structural controls, your reservoir distribution, as well as your seal integrity. And the key part here is that it can all be combined together into existing interpretation, right? You can run with these results and they're readily integratable. Now that we've covered the first case study, I'd like to now take you to kind of one of the, my favorites, which is channels. And so this is specifically in offshore New Zealand. And what's unique, right, this interactive data-centric approach, because we focus on the labels, you're starting with a blank network every time. And so as you tune those labels, it's really fit for purpose and specific to that data set. So you're removing any bias from already pre-labeled sessions. We'll look at some channel fairware mapping here. And what I have shown in yellow, again, these are predictions on a non-labeled line, right? You can see that the inline direction for the channel prediction versus the cross-line direction are intersecting quite well. And similar to before, we can extract those geobodies for the entire channelized interval. When you juxtapose it with well data, you can even extract seismic attributes on them. And this entire workflow, from start to finish, data import, training up a new neural network, providing more, uh, new labels, right, and getting this level of prediction and the outputs was done in about seven and a half hours total. And again, in it being able to readily integrate those. And the key part here is because it's data-centric, it's focused on the geoscientist's input. It's not relying on sort of more black box approaches where we don't necessarily have that full control that we'd like, but rather now the geoscientist has full control on optimizing that neural network specific for that task. We looked at some cool geobodies, but because of the data-centric approach, it can be even expanded to the horizon domain. Perhaps you're focused on really analyzing channel cuts and the surfaces generated from it. Similar to before, as you were labeling faults or you're labeling your reservoir or even labeling the channels, you can label the channel cut horizon and you can generate the predictions that is shown here in the cyan color. Labels are in red, predictions are shown here in yellow. We also have the predictions shown in 3D with the green uh, figure that we see there. And it's a probability range between zero and one, essentially zero to 100%. And very quickly, you can analyze things as in size values, channel cuts, uh, really understand those overbank deposits. And this was all done in eight and a half hours. So you have a lot of flexibility in the geologic things that you can extract and analyze with the interactive data-centric approach. And the final one is we looked at some great 3D volumes that were high quality, and that's fantastic. But we also know that in our exploration workflows, we can be data limited oftentimes. And so this same workflow can be applied in the 2D domain as well. And so here we'll be looking at the Pegasus Basin offshore New Zealand and critically focusing in on another kind of shallow hazard, which is gas hydrates. Here on this seismic section, we'll see that I have a peculiar kind of high amplitude response, which is located in the middle of the section. These are called bottom simulating reflectors. And it's characterized because there's trapped gas below that methane, right? And what we can do with interactive, with the interactive deep learning approach is that here in yellow, these are the predictions on the entire 2D line. And this was generated in 20 minutes. And we can see the extent of those BSRs in the subsurface. But more importantly, what's the challenge here is that BSRs are easy to identify. Big, bright amplitude anomalies but how they interconnect may be more challenging, especially if there's no gas present. And so by using this interactive data-centric approach, you as a geoscientist can kind of analyze, well, I think there may be a BSR here, or maybe it's there, and you can help guide the network to identify that specific element, and more importantly, translate that into a three-dimensional space. So here we can see two different 2D lines that are intersecting with each other, and the prediction, the probability is shown here in red, right? And it can be also applied to subsequent lines. So you can quickly characterize in about 20 minutes the extent of the gas hydrates in that specific interval. What's really cool about this is that it can be applied to really any data set or any other data set with similar responses, right? This data-centric approach is not restricted to any specific data set per se or geologic feature. Since it's from scratch, you as a geoscientist can use your expertise Take the data-centric approach to fine-tune your labels and have a deep learning algorithm guiding you and saying, well, should I consider those faults? Should I consider that reservoir? And really complete the entire interpretation workflow. 
What I'd like to now walk you through is an example of that live. We've shown some cool examples, but let's actually take a test drive and see how that interactive deep learning is working in real time. So we looked at this example from before. This is from the data-centric approach, and we're showing that kind of 30-second interactive cycle, right, of fine-tuning your labels. It's completely blank. I have no labels, and what I'd like to show you now is how quickly it can converge to a solution based off of your labels. And I want to reiterate, what I'm showing here, you'll actually be able to take it for a test drive live over there to the side. You'll be able to interact with some of our expert geoscientists to help you get started. You can add a new interpretation layer, you can give it a name. In this case, I'm specifically interested in faults. And so what I'll do is now, I can actually provide labels in real time on the seismic data set, and I can adjust things such as the thickness, right, for maybe lower frequency faults where that fault plane is not as well expressed, or I can even make it thinner if I have a high frequency data set, right? And what you can do is continue the labeling process. Here, my labels are shown in green, and you can provide these as labels to that deep learning network. And what I'd like to now do is after a very quick initial labeling of this data set, I can actually launch the training and watch the feedback in real time and sort of fine tune it based off of the feedback it gives me. I mean, I'm still about two years, three years in industry and kind of having that expert advice over my shoulder, right, from the network, but also from other networks developed by expert geoscientists can really help me fill in the extent of these faults and other geologic features quite quickly. So now I'll launch the training. We see this bar that's bouncing back and forth at the top, and so this is initializing the deep learning. We can see that as it's starting, starting to uh, start training, right, it's gonna take these labels in, re uh, in real time and actually add it, right, and learn from it. So now it starts from here and it goes all the way to the end. That is the essentially one iteration, one epoch of training. That means that it's gone through all of my training data once and it'll deploy a new prediction. And you can see that it learns from my labels in real time. I can add it in and really fine tune the deep learning network. And you can see already it's starting to snap to the faults very quickly and that was just in a few seconds and I started completely from scratch. And you can continue adding on to that same labeled line and teaching and guiding the network, right? Instead of using sort of these pre-labeled sessions, you can really focus in on identifying what is representative in that specific data set. And so here I'll hide the labels and you can see the predictions that are made on that line. It snaps to it quite well. I can even go to other unlabeled portions of the data set and see how it's performing. Again, we said that a new deep learning network is being uh, deployed every 30 seconds. So what you can do is go to other lines and continue guiding it and giving direct feedback. And this is what we mean by the interactive approach, right? It's helping you consider all of those different possibilities and the true extent of the various features. Because it's, being le it's learning from your labels, right? It's not being influenced by any other biases. It's really focused in specifically on what the data, the geoscientist is providing to that network in real time. And so you can see here in yellow, it's giving me all of these different faults that I can go ahead and validate and add in and continue with the training process. This is the interactive workflow, right? You can go to other lines as well. This one's specifically non-labeled, right? And we did this in about you know, two to three minutes. And so applying this to other geological features, reservoir, source rock interval, channels, et cetera, it really gives you the ability to hone in on that optimal solution. And so now, kind of what's next, right? We talked about this interactive approach, and that's fantastic, but we really want to kind of push forward and to take something from Tesla. In this case, right, multi-class prediction on cars. Is it a tree? Is it a human? Is it a traffic light? Is it a car? Well, what if we could translate that into the seismic world? Is it pre-salt, post-salt, rafted sediments, or actually salt itself? And so we can use this multi-class approach and make it interactive. The same workflow that we were using for faults, you can use in the multi-class space. We use, for instance, here, what we have shown is the prediction for four different classifications, rafted sediments, salt, pre-salt, and uh, post-salt. What you can use is take that stratigraphic framework use it as a mask, a full 3D mask, and focus in on predicting salt facies within your data. 
And this is all interactive. It's not just interactive labeling and training, it's also interactive masking in full 3D. What you can do is then use those probability cubes and geobodies as we were showing before, but now it's in the multi-class space and you can display them and it adheres to your seismic data. So that's what's coming in the future. And what we're really excited for is, we talked a lot about this and we showed you some of the cool features you can do, but you can actually take that for a test drive yourself. You can work with those petroleum system elements, those channels, right? And actually see the interactive process live and with your hands. So we'll have some stations set up over there. We hope that you enjoyed your lunch and that you enjoyed the presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to myself, Scotty, Anna, or any of the other distinguished Bluer colleagues that we have here today. We thank you again for joining us.